In the holy name of Jesus, amen. At its essence, the law is simple and uncomplicated. You can learn it all, of course, as you do in the Ten Commandments. You can learn it all, yes, even standing on one foot and recite it. It's really just this. What is hateful to you, to your neighbor, don't do. What is hateful to you, to your neighbor, don't do. St. Paul nods in agreement. The whole law is fulfilled in this statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Lord, our Lord, echoes them both, actually, adding love toward God when he says, and we heard today, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something curious. He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That is to say, everything else outside of love God and love neighbor is just more commentary. But a happy commentary it is not. For the rest of the law and the prophets comment on how folks learned the whole law standing on one foot while using their other foot to not love their neighbor, but kick them. Think about Cain. Cain takes out his anger at the heavens by reddening the earth with his brother's blood. The rape-hungry sodomites attempted to gratify their lust on Lot's two out-of-town visitors. The belly-aching Israelites get sick of God's food and want to stone God's prophet. Saul hounds David. David impregnates Bathsheba and murders her husband, Bathsheba's grandfather, Ahithophel becomes a Judas Iscariot to King David when David's own son Absalom attempts a coup and winds up slipping a noose around his own neck. It's really all the law and the prophets are just more and more stories that make even soap operas look quite tame. So the unkept command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is abbreviated to what is quite keepable. You shall love dot, 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 yourself. (laughs) So it's still beyond the walls of this church, where in the name of self-love, murder masquerades as compassion. Perversion is now called entertainment. And the God of this world keeps cranking up the volume as even the singer will sing, loving yourself is the greatest love of all. But of all those who act in self-love, those with the greatest guilt are not out there, not part of the church, but rather here in the pew or around the altar or standing even tonight in the pulpit. Because to those to whom much is given, much is required. For think of it this way, who is worse, the child or the adult who steals from the store? Even though the child may know that what he's doing is wrong because he is immature and doesn't fully comprehend the gravity of his actions, we can at least partially excuse his behavior. But the mature adult, who knows very well that what he does is forbidden and consciously violates that law, well, there is no excuse. And we are mature adults. Those within the church, as Paul would say, not immature children like those of the world. We have violated not that of which we are ignorant, but that of which we are fully aware. If you want proof, simply look at how well we attempt to cover up our evil deeds. We know well how to wear gloves when we stab others in the back. Our skillfulness at acting out lies Well, that would make even Hollywood jealous. Over time, with enough practice, we can begin to convince ourselves that since no thunderbolt has fallen from the skies, God must simply just be looking the other way or even winking at our naughtiness. And yet we pray tonight, Lord, 
have mercy. What more is there to say? Lord, have mercy. If the law really has one thing to say, you shall love the neighbor as yourself, then we lawbreakers really have only one thing with which to respond. Lord, have mercy. Not, oh God, give me another chance, or I'll do better, or, but God, I really didn't mean to. And not, oh Lord, I promise to make it up to you. Whatever. If the law is learned while standing on one foot, the best response thereafter is to drop to both knees and to pray, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, for your law I have not kept. And of course, it's mercy that your Lord wants to give. That is his greatest delight. An ancient tradition has it that when the Egyptians were drowning in the Red Sea, that the heavenly choir started to break out in song, but the Lord silenced them chiding, the works of my hands are drowning, and you want to sing? Hell is not the laughingstock of heaven. The Lord takes no delight in the death of the sinner. Rather, he takes pleasure in those who are cleansed through the sacrifice in which he did delight. To that curious phrase, if all the law and the prophets hang on the words, love God and love neighbor, those words hang on something else. It's on the crucifix that they hang. As St. Paul testifies, Christ canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Colossians 2, 14. Christ canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. So the picture that was on the cover of the bulletin on Sunday is thus quite right. I don't think there were any bulletins left, but I'll describe it for you. It was a cross, and then on the cross were hanging the two tablets. Two tablets of the law that were hanging from the tree of sacrifice because on that tree their demands have been met. God threatens to punish all who break these commandments as we've been praying this week but he punishes his son instead for your sake. He promises grace and every blessing to all those who keep these commandments and that grace and blessing he gives to you for Jesus has kept the law and the prophets on your behalf. What was given at Sinai is fulfilled at Calvary. The lawgiver lawgiver keeps his own law. The judge takes the criminal's place and you go free. It's for the joy that was set before him that Jesus did all this, has done all of this. For your salvation is his joy. He gladly bore the thorns, that you might wear the crown of glory. He willingly was stripped of his robes, that you might be clothed in his righteousness. He readily loved those who hated him, for he loves the unlovable, and in so doing transforms them into his friends. So what's most remarkable of all is that he still loves you. Despite your lies, he speaks the truth when he says, you are mine. Despite your self-love, he never stops loving the selfishness out of you and loving you into your neighbor. Despite the fact that he sees deep, dark, hidden evils within you that you think you've hidden from all the world, he still doesn't see you as an enemy, but as a precious child, one for whom he gave his life, and one for whom all his suffering was very much worth it. For if earthly fathers delight in their children, how much more does your heavenly Father delight in you? On Jesus hang all the law and the prophets. In the holy name of Jesus.